Why are you looking at me that way, Susan? Because you're sulking. I suppose I am. <laughs> Joseph Brown, you surprise me. I've never heard you express your feelings before. After all these years, I've learned not to argue with you. Mm. <laughs> After all these years, I seem not to understand you. Oh, you understand me too well. Apparently not. You drafted the petition to establish Minnesota as, as a territory, yes? Yes. And to make St. Paul the capital. Yes. And today it was unanimously approved by all of the delegates. Yes. So the Stillwater Convention was a success. Yes. Then why are you sulking? Edward Phelan was one of the delegates. Phelan, what's it been, like eight years since the jury let him go? Why do you still let it bother you? Because, by George, he murdered a good man. John Hayes was a well-respected army sergeant who didn't deserve that violent death. Every time I see Phelan, I'm reminded of my failure. Oh, Joseph, you were the justice of the peace. You were not the jury. By George, I knew Phelan did it, but I couldn't prove it. He came up with that preposterous story that the Indians killed Sergeant Hayes. But I knew Hayes was dead by Phelan's hand even before Phelan stumbled into Evan's house that night. Well, thank you, Evans. You two have had yourselves good traveling weather this week. Yeah, we've been moving well. Mississippi's low, so the current's not so bad. Huh. Still, it's a long paddle up from the St. Croix. I'm used to it. How about you, Foy? Don't mind. Me, I date making that trip. Huh, not if you've got Foy along. Let me tell you, this guy, he's a great storyteller. Well, let me get a word in edgewise. Ain't that right, Foy? <laughs> I'm glad you could stop in. Always nice to have visitors. I figure we got a day before we hit St. Peter, and we'll bring you supplies on our return trip. Expecting you. You can let me in? Why, of course. You alone? Just me. Hayes is, um, uh, Hayes is at home. Who you got here? <laughs> can you believe it? Three visitors in one night. Uh, Scotty, of course, you, you already know. Balaam. And this is his friend, uh, his name is John Foy. Uh, you want to set that down? Huh? Your paddle. Oh, my paddle. Been a rough night. Yeah, it shows. You might want to try using that on the inside of a canoe. I didn't come by canoe. Well, there's your problem, Phelan. Paddle doesn't work a lick unless you're inside a canoe. I'm going to have to teach you the finer points of navigating the river. I walked. Looks like you crawled. You done? And now you must sit. I'll get you some food, and you can grace us with your story. You look like you could use a drink. Always. Boy, bad little whiskey. Brings you down the river. Uh, just looking for a missing cow is all a little one, a, a, a calf. I slept on a log walking across the creek, fell down on the rocks, cracked my paddle, the damn calf. Even lost my damn hat. It's getting dark, so I come up here. Hayes didn't come with you? No, Hayes, uh, Hayes is at home. That's too bad. Would have been nice to see him. Don't mind. We'll be going up river, so we'll stop by tomorrow. Stop by? Well, yeah. If that's all right with you, Foy. Then it's said we'll come by tomorrow morning. No, no, don't, don't bother. He'll be out searching for the calf. All morning? Well, yeah, he was talking about going down to Little Crow's village tomorrow looking for it. You know, we've been having some problems with the Indians. He's thinking the Indians might have, might have taken the, uh, the calf. Well, what kind of problems? Why does he think that? Oh, yeah, just problems. Yeah. Well, I fancy we'll be needing to stop come your place anyway, and we'll need to get some more whiskey. Uh, well, Pig's Eye's new saloon. I mean, it'll be right in your way. 
Aren't you the guy who called Pig's Eye a chiseler because he watered down his whiskey? Uh, well, it's just on your way is all I'm saying. And the price is cheap. Yeah, water usually is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he waters it so bad anymore. Well, might be interesting to see his new place. Boy, you decide. Don't mind. Boy, he don't mind. <laughs> now, Phelan, tell me, any news in these parts? No news. No stories? I ain't got no stories. <laughs> oh, sure you do. You just told us some crazy yarn about you paddling across land looking for a missing calf and a lost hat. <laughs> that weren't no yarn. Uh, ben and jean Gav Gervais just had another baby. I don't think I know that. Uh, about three miles upriver. Well, good for them. You don't get much news about babies. My first white child born here. Well, I'm getting tired. Clearly, we're out of whiskey. What do you say, Foy? Should you turn in? We're going to get an early start in the morning. I'll just grab this spot in the corner here. Of course. Hey, Phil, you want to travel with us? Faster to walk. Well, you can make some good use of that paddle. I said I'm walking. None Looking for the you. calf anyhow. None of you leave before I get you a good breakfast in the morning. You're giving us the right warm welcome, Evans. time. How'd you get here so fast? Didn't you stop at Pig's Eye Saloon? No. Well, why not? Where's Scotty? River Bottom. Why didn't he come up here with you? What's he doing down there? Don't know. Well, why didn't he come up here? Don't know. What's he doing down there? Don't know. Well, Hayes ain't here if that's who you come to look for. He put him across the river this morning. I told you he wouldn't be here. I don't know why you stopped by. What's Scotty doing down there? There's finally up here. Boy, there's a lot of blood down there. Blood? Well, yeah, and it looked fresh. Don't know nothing about it. Say, do you think that might be your lost cat? No. No? No, I said. Well, come on, I'll show you. No, not necessary. Uh, none of our animals have been wounded. Probably one of Gervais' cows. They, they uh, graze down there good off, go off. OK. And where is Hayes at? I put him across the river this morning. He's out searching for the calf. You didn't tell him we were coming? No, he wanted to get on with the calf. Well, sounds like Hayes. Once he makes up his mind, nobody's going to change it. I was just telling Foy about that. Foy, didn't I just say that about Hayes? You did. Yeah. Tell him what else I said about Hayes. <laughs> that he always likes to act all proper, OK? Always a sergeant, putting on his best clothes. You live with him, Phelan. Isn't that the way he is? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hell, this morning, before he takes off, he even puts on his best clothes, his blue jacket and his uh, gray pantaloon pants. <laughs> his best clothes to look for a calf? Why would he do that? Well, it's like you say, he always likes to look nice and proper. That don't sound like Hayes. He wouldn't want to get his fancy clothes all soiled. Well, you know, I tell him that. I said, Hayes, you're going to soil those clothes if, if you go take those on the walk down to Little Crow's Village. But, you know, as you say, Hayes makes up his mind. There ain't man likely to change it. That's right. That's Hayes. Isn't that what I said about him for? You did. Looks like you and Hayes have been doing some work on the place here. I do all the work. Yeah, yeah. That's because Hayes is a sergeant and you're just a private, ain't that right? Yeah, that's right. He even wanted a root house built up the hill here. On top of that, he wanted me to throw the dirt up the hill and set it down the hill where it would have been a lot easier. Basil, just two days old. Oh, you've done a good job, Mrs. Gervais. Thank you. First white child born in the area, I'm told. Yes. I expect you'll be getting a good many visitors. Where are Ben and the boys? Come again. Ben and the boys. You 
just missed Sophia Perry. The Perrys are wonderful neighbors. Sophia and her mother have been a great help to me with Basil. I was asking on Ben. Oh, out in the field with the boys. I'm expecting they'll be back soon. Can I get you some food? Uh, no, no, I won't be staying long. Hmm. Good sleeper? How's that? Uh, the, the baby. Is he a good sleeper? Not bad. You sure I can't get you anything? No, no, no. You say Ben will be back any moment Where's now? Where's Hayes? Hayes is out searching for a lost cap. He sends his regards on the child. I put him across the river this morning. Across the river? Well, yeah, he gets to thinking that maybe the Indians, uh, they took the cap. So he's walking down to Little Crow's village. But why didn't you go with him? Well, I surely would have, ma'am, but Hayes wanted me to stay back at our place to make sure we didn't lose any more cows. You should have gone with him. Don't make no sense to go off wandering alone. Well, ma'am, Hayes, you got to understand, he wanted to go on his lonesome. Hell, he even turned down a, a, a seat in a canoe from a fellow who was going down the river this morning. What fella? Huh? What fella? Well, I, I think it was one of Hayes' men, or one, one of Baker's men, rather. One of Baker's men was stopped by this morning, and he said he was going down river in the canoe, and he offered Hayes a ride. Hayes turned him down, said he wanted to walk. The fellow takes off and goes on down. Hayes gets himself dressed, finishes his breakfast, and I put him across the river. I think that's dangerous, going down there alone. Well, ma'am, you got to understand. When, when, when Hayes makes up his mind to do something, there ain't man that any man that can rightly change his mind. Hayes is just a stubborn man. You got to understand that everybody can tell you that. Well, this morning, as a matter of fact, he puts on his best clothes to go down to Little Crow's Village. I say to him, Hayes, that don't make no sense. You're going to soil those clothes. Hayes says, I don't mind. Does it anyhow. That's just Hayes. So I get to thinking. Maybe what he's really going down for is a wife. You see, he's going to go, he's going down to the village. He's going to be wearing his best clothes. It's not about the calf at all. He wants to find himself an Indian wife. That's why he goes on his lonesome, and that's why he's wearing his best clothes. Well, ma'am, I, I better get going. I want to be able to watch across the river for when Hayes comes back, you know. Now, if Miss Perry comes by, you be sure to give her my greeting. Will you do that? Oh, I will. What's the good word? Did you find your air and calf? That's what I come to talk to you about. You know, on Friday, I put Hayes across the river to head down looking for that calf. What's that? Well, going down to Little Crow's Village, he's thinking that the Indian might have taken it. The calf? Yeah, yeah. Well, he ain't returned since. The calf? Uh, no, Hayes. Uh, this was on Friday? Yeah, two days ago. Well, have you gone looking for him? Well, no, because now I'm thinking that maybe he went on down past Little Crow's Village down to Hayes and Moore's place on Great Cloud Island. Might be, they're friends. Yeah, and it's on account of that, and account Hewers, Moore, uh, Moore, he lives right across the river from Medicine Bottles Village. In Indians over there are thinking maybe they took the calf. Oh. Good, good. Yeah. Hayes was talking about that before he left this morning, or yesterday morning. He, he said, you know, maybe I'll just go right on down by Little Crows and all the way down to Great Cloud Island, down where Hayes and Moore lives. Well, I hope he finds your errant cat. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to be getting going. Well, stay and eat. Uh, no, no, uh, I'm going back to Gervais' cabin. Oh, I need to get up there myself. They just had themselves another baby. First white child born here. Uh, you told me. I seen it. <laughs> back? But that was two days ago. It don't take two days to get to Little Crows and back. Yes, ma'am. That, that's why now I'm figuring that maybe he went on past down, down past Little Crows Village, 
all the way down to Grey Cloud Island, where Hayes and Moore lives. He's going there on foot? Well, that's another, what, 10 miles? Well, ma'am, it's on account of Moore. He speaks Dakota, and he's right across the river from Medicine Bottles Village. And maybe Hayes was thinking that he could look into the Indian situation down there and find that cab. You know who's just up the hill at the Perry's cabin? Joseph Brown. Sophia told me he's visiting them. You should go up there and talk to him. Why? Why? Well, he's Hayes and Moore's neighbor is why. And he's the justice of the peace. Well, well I don't think I should be bothering him. Well, don't want to be bothering him. Well, Brown just come up from Grey Cloud Island. He could tell you if Hayes was down there. Oh. Well, get on up there and ask him. Uh, maybe later. Later? Well, ma'am, it's on account of these clothes. They're all dirty and stuff. Got all the muck on them, got walking this way. Uh, you know, I'm not in any condition to be making a visit at the Perry House. Oh, you visited me. <laughs> well, that's different, ma'am. You gotta understand, I don't want Miss Perry to see me in this same dirty shirt that he'd seen me in before. I'll just go home and clean up a bit before I do that. You understand? No, I don't understand. Phelan, missed you last time. Oh, hello, Ben. Phelan thinks Hayes, uh, Hayes hasn't come back. Back from where? Well, he went to Little Crow's Village. What for? Well, remember I told you he went looking for his calf? I, I do remember. Well, he ain't come back. That was two days ago. I know. It don't take two days to go to Little Crow's and back. I know. He should be back by now. He thinks Hayes went to Hayes and Moore's place. Well, go ask Joseph Brown. He's just up the hill. I just told him that. Well, and, and I surely will do that, but now I got to get getting back to my place to watch out for Hayes coming across the river so I can pick him up. But I tell you, if Hayes isn't back today, I'll surely go searching for him tomorrow. Yeah, if he ain't back today, you come get me and we'll go search together. Uh, thank you, Ben, kindly, that's a nice offer. But I'd just soon go on my lonesome. I'm coming with you. Well, Ben, look, it's just that I want to get an early start and uh, I put him across the river so I know where he'd be starting and I know where he's going so I can make that search my own. I said, I'm coming with you. Well, okay, well, uh, thank you then. Oh, by the way, damnedest thing, that missing calf, it ain't missing no more. Came back in as lonesome. You best go talk to Joseph Brown. Uh, yes, ma'am. What brings you two downriver? We're trying to catch up with John Hayes. He was headed here. To our mission? Why? Well, he's looking for a lost calf and wanted to come down to the Indian village here. Well, why would he think that his calf would be here? Uh, it seems he got it in his head that the Indians here might have taken it. Well, we can ask. Ask what? Ask the Indians about the calf. Well, it ain't here. We know that. Well, I thought you just said that he was well, going it, to Well, Hayes thought it was going to be here, but it's returned on his lonesome since then. But Hayes don't know that yet. Well, Sarah, we haven't seen Hayes since the summer, have we? No. Well, if Hayes ain't been here, then there's no sense our taking any more of their time. Let's go, Ben. It's getting on three days now since we last saw him. What? Three days? Come on, Ben. Let's Are get going. Are you sure he was coming here? No. Yes. We've been working he said he was coming here. But we've been working our way downriver all day, and we didn't see any tracks. Even at the landing, we didn't see any tracks. We saw tracks. Oh, those weren't his. You said he was wearing boots. Well, yeah, but they probably got washed out in the rain on Sunday. Yeah, it didn't rain much. I would think that there would still be traces after only three days. Well, listen, Hayes ain't been here. No sense in us being around any longer. Come on, let's get back. Ben, it's always good to see you. That man Phelan certainly behaves badly when he's upset. Now, Sarah, you have to remember that man is one of God's creatures. 
you up here to Fort Snelling? What regards Hayes? How, how is my good friend? He's gone missing. Missing? Yeah. Four days ago, I put him across the river to walk down to Little Crow's Village searching for a missing cat. Well, he ain't been back. Yesterday, Ben Gervais and I, we went searching all up and down the river trying to find him. We didn't even find any tracks. We figured out that they probably got washed out in the, in, the, in the rain on Sunday. We found no trace of them. Now I'm afraid that the Indians killed them. Killed them? That's all I can reckon. Why do you reckon that? Well, Hayes was thinking he might find them devouring our missing calf. They stole your calf? No. Uh, I'm confused. Well, Hayes thought they did, uh, but it's returned on its lonesome. So why did they kill him? I think for his clothes. His clothes? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, he was looking for a wife, I think. You're not making any sense. Well, when Hayes left, he puts on his best clothes, you know, for his walk down the river. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You know how Hayes, he always likes to keep his clothes nice and clean and looking good. Maybe you better start over in the beginning. <laughs> well, Hayes has been telling me that he'd like to get himself an Indian wife. So he's thinking he's going to go down to Little Crow's Village looking for that calf. He can look for a wife at the same time. That's why he goes down on his lonesome wearing his best clothes. Well, why do you think they killed him? Well, he had trouble with one of those Indians about a month ago. Oh, uh, who? Don't know. An Indian came to our cabin very angry, pointing his gun around at everything. Angry about what? I don't know. I don't speak English, Indian. But Hayes does a little, I think. Anyhow, I, I goes away for a while, maybe 20 minutes, and I heard a gunshot, and I came back. The Indian shot at him? No. Hayes had taken the gun away, and he shot it. At the Indian? No. He shot it outside the cabin. Why? Well, to empty out the gun, I suppose. It's just as though the Indian was in the cabin pointing the gun at a looking glass. Hayes wrestled the gun away from him went outside and shot it. He came in and he said to that Indian, you ever come to our cabin again, I'm gonna thump you good. The Indian was angry, he said, I'm gonna tell Chief Big Thunder about the rough treatment you've given me. That's according to Hayes. Chief Big Thunder from Little Crow's Village. Yeah. Hayes figured he was gonna have some trouble with the Indians over that. Let's go search for him. No need. Ben Chervais and I went yesterday and we no find, didn't find any tracks at all. Well. Ben doesn't speak Dakota. I do, and he's a good friend of mine. So we're gonna look again. Come on. Emerson, what can I do for you? You knew Sergeant Hayes when he was stationed here at Fort Snelling, didn't you? Very well. I'm afraid that a body's been found, and the suspicion is that it is Sergeant Hayes. I was afraid of that. Everett Phelan came here three weeks ago and told me that Hayes had gone missing. He thought that the Indians might have killed him, so I reported it to our Indian agent, Major Tolliver. Well, it seems it was an Indian who reported finding the body to Major Tolliver. It appears that uh, one of his sons found the body in the river down near Carver's Cave. Carver's Cave? But that's not where we were looking. How's that? Well, I went with Phelan to search, but we were on the opposite side of the river. Well, I've been asked to go down there to examine the body and to take you and a couple of others who knew Sergeant Hayes. Henry 
Sidley, my well, friend. Hello, Joseph. Joseph, come in. Welcome. Sit down. So good to see you again. Thank you for coming. Of course. So there was a crime that happened in my jurisdiction? Well, it appears that way. Uh, you see, a man named uh, John Hayes was uh, murdered, beaten to death, bad situation. And some Indian boys found his body right down close to Carver's Cave. Uh, uh, when was this? Well, it was about a month ago. You see, uh, uh, Hayes had been a, a soldier here at Fort Snelling. Uh, he'd been a sergeant uh, until his discharge. Uh, so when uh, we learned about his murder, I, I thought I would get some uh, preliminary investigation and I reviewed uh, the situation with some of the locals, uh, took some statements as a way of getting things started. But it's, uh, you know, I figured we'd do that until uh, you and I had a chance to talk. But it's clearly your case and uh, you should take the lead from here. Well, what have you learned? Well, here's my case book. You can look at it, look at the notes. Uh, I've come to believe that a man named Edward Phelan uh, was responsible for this. You see, Phelan and Hayes were housemates. They lived together. And around uh, first week in September, Hayes disappeared. Uh, Phelan immediately started telling all kinds of strange stories. Uh, related to Hayes' uh, disappearance. Uh, first, uh, there was a story about Hayes searching for a lost calf. Uh, then there was a story about some gun-wielding Indian visitors threatening uh, uh, Hayes. Uh, finally, uh, Phelan announced that he was sure that uh, Indians from uh, Little Crow's Village had murdered Hayes. Well, Major Tolliver was suspicious right from the beginning. He uh, uh, he suspected that, that Phelan was involved in Hayes' disappearance. And when the body was discovered, uh, Major Tolliver asked me to look into it. Uh, I did look into it, and I can tell you, Joseph, I found absolutely nothing to support Phelan's uh, Indian theory. What I did find, however, were many, many discrepancies in Phelan's story. Why did Sibley want to talk to you? He transferred a murder case to me. Oh? A fellow by the name of John Hayes was found dead last month. Oh. It, it seems like we have a good suspect, Edward Phelan, his housemate. Mm. Oh. I, I just have to complete the investigation. Ah. Ah? Uh, <laughs> what do you mean, ah? Uh? Now I understand why you are fretting. I'm not fretting. Mm. You are questioning Sibley's motivation for transferring the case to you. It's just a matter of jurisdiction. Sibley's authority is limited to the uh, Iowa Territory on the west side of the Mississippi. Mine is the Wisconsin Territory on the east side. That's where his body was found. Well, then why are you fretting? Stop saying that. <sighs> Did Sibley know where the body was found when uh, he started the investigation? Of course. And he's only just transferring it to you now, a month later? Mm. The case against Phelan must not be very strong. Oh, it is. I, I read Sibley's entire case file, and it's strong enough that I've issued a warrant for his arrest. And yet you fret. I've read the affidavit you gave before Henry Sibley about the disappearance of Sergeant John Hayes. I ain't got nothing to add. You maintain you put him across the river on the morning of Friday, September 6th to look for a lost calf. Yeah. And he hoped by visiting Little Crow's village to find them feasting on the meat of it. That's right. That's where your affidavit starts but I would like to know more about what happened in the days leading up to his disappearance. 
Uh, nothing happened, just a calf went missing, that's all. When exactly? Oh, uh, the day before. I went all the way down the river to, to, to Evan's place looking for the calf. Came night, I went up to Evan's spot, spent the night there, came home to my cabin the next morning and put haze across the river. William Evans, okay? I'll need to talk to him. I also need to talk to the visitor Hayes had the morning before you took him across the river. I don't recall Hayes talking to anybody that morning. Mrs. Gervais said that you told her that Hayes had a visitor. No, we didn't have any visitor that morning. Oh, she was very specific. A fur trader who offered Hayes a ride in his canoe down to Little Crow's village. Nah, that's wrong. Why would she give false witness? Uh, that lady is as deaf as a rock. She probably misunderstood my words. Mr. and Mrs. Gervais, thank you for coming in to see me. My name is Joseph R. Brown. I'm the Justice of the Peace for Crawford County. How's that? This is Joseph Brown. I know who he is. What's he saying? You met Henry Sibley. <laughs> Hayes found east of the Mississippi, my jurisdiction, case transferred to me. Why are you talking like that? Are you slow? No, ma'am. Did you arrest Phelan? Yes, ma'am. Good. I read Sibley's case notes on his interview with you, and there are some uh, some contradictions with Phelan's account. I told Sibley straight. Don't care what Phelan said. Not going to tell you anything different. You told Sibley that Phelan came over to your house on Friday, September 6th. Uh, are you sure of that date? Sure, I'm sure. It was two days after Basil was born. Wasn't expecting Phelan. Figured he came because he heard about the baby. First white child born here, you know. You also said that Phelan told you uh, that Hayes had a visitor that morning. Which didn't sit right with me. Why's that? Well, because Hayes refused to ride downriver from him. If your idea is to go to Little Crow's Village and one of Baker's men is headed in that direction and offers to take you, do you walk all that way? No, I wouldn't. This was one of Baker's men? Burger the Baker the fur trader? I don't know the man. And what was his name? Baker. No. The name of Baker's man, the guy who gave him the offer. I don't recollect. Do you? Well, he wasn't there. He was out in the field with the boys when Phelan come by. Did uh, Phelan denied that he told you that Hayes had a visitor that morning. I know what I heard. Begging your pardon, but Phelan believes that you mistook his words because you're hard of hearing. He knows I'm hard of hearing, so he spoke loud in consequence. I am confident that was the purport of his words. Phelan said that Hayes refused the ride, ate breakfast, got dressed in his best clothes. I thought that was strange. <coughs> and then Phelan dropped him across the river. That's all Phelan said on the matter till he came back on Sunday. Saturday. Sunday. According to Phelan, he came back the following day to tell you that Hayes was missing. You think I don't know my days? It was the same day you were visiting the Perrys. Oh, that was a Sunday. Yes, yeah, Sunday. That's what I've been saying. Phelan stopped by to say he figured Hayes had gone to Hayes and Moore's place, and that's why he wasn't back yet. So I told him to talk to you since you'd just come up from down there. He didn't, did he? No, he didn't. 
I met uh, Phelan for the first time a few days ago. I think he has eyes for Sophia. Said he didn't want to go over there because he wasn't presentable or some such nonsense. He ain't a good man. Sophia needs to stay clear of him. You tell her father that. Mr. Gervais, I have a question for you. You went with Phelan to look for Hayes. When did that happen? Early the next day. Monday. <laughs> Phelan took us across the river to where he dropped Hayes off. We examined to see if any of Hayes' tracks were perceptible, but we could find no trace. You used to work as a trapper, a guide, a voyager for the Hudson's Bay Fur Company. That's right. So you speak with authority on tracking people. I think so. Uh, and you would have expected to see tracks. The beach there was sand and gravel. I would think that a man wearing leather boots would have left traces that would have still been perceptible two or three days after he passed. We did find some old round-toed tracks as we worked our way down river, but they were headed in the wrong direction and the boots that Hayes was wearing had square toes. Thank you for your time. That'll be all. Can you please ask Mr. Evans to come in? Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Evans. Please sit down. I have a few questions in regard to the Hayes murder. I hope I can help. John Hayes was a good man. Did Phelan sleep over at your house on the evening of September 5th? I can't recall the exact day or even the week, but he did stay one night in, in early September, I think. Uh, what do you call about it? What do you recall about his visit? He came after dark to the house, said he had lost his way while looking for a calf and wished to remain the whole night as he could not find his way home in the dark. He left in the morning after breakfast, about the same time as Scott and the other man, maybe a few minutes after. There were other people with you when Phelan visited? Stephen Scott and, and his traveling partner. Don't know his name. Don't know that he said a word the whole time he was there. But uh, they arrived maybe an hour before Phelan did. I'll need to talk to them. Uh, there are a couple of lumbermen from the St. Croix, inseparable from what I've seen. What was Phelan's demeanor that morning? He was annoyed, I, uh, on account of losing the calf and, and Scotty making jokes on him. What's that then? Uh, Scotty just kept making fun. He was, he was just having a good time, but he should have known better. Phelan, he don't have no tolerance for that, especially when he's been drinking. So you can imagine, Phelan weren't too pleased when Scotty said they'd stop by his house the next morning. They were heading to Phelan's house? Well, that's what they said, to see Hayes. To see Hayes? I'll definitely need to talk to those two. Susan, I may have found some people who can testify about the morning Phelan took Hayes across the river. No, I thought I sensed an improvement in your mood. Sibley didn't know about them. Ah, there it is. Always a competition between you two. He was investigating what happened after Hayes disappeared, but that's not where the answers lie. Real investigative work, that's about determining what happened before. Uh, do you doubt that Phelan did it? Oh, no. He murdered him. There's no question in my mind that Phelan, uh, Sibley got that right. Every word out of Phelan's mouth is a lie. And you don't do that uh, unless you're trying to hide something. Phelan's lies are very easy to detect. He's an idiot. <laughs> but that's not a crime, which is fortunate for the people who live in the Iowa Territory. <laughs> so why did he do it? I don't know. Well, there must be a reason he did it. Uh, that is important in your legal system, right? Yes. Yet you found no reason, no reason at all to explain why he would kill Hayes. Nothing? Are you trying to ruin my good mood? 
I don't know why I love you so much. I'm investigating the death of Sergeant John Hayes. Your names came up in my discussion with William Evans. Which one of you is Scott? That's me. And this here is John Foy. Ain't that right, Foy? <laughs> On September 5th, was a, which was a Thursday, did you sleep over at Evans' house that night? Yes, we stopped there on our way down to St. Peter. And one of you, um, Scott, you knew the deceased John Hayes very well. I did. We were soldiers together at Fort Snelling. But Foy, you were not acquainted with him. You don't talk much, do you? Ah, uh, he's from Indiana. <laughs> so while the two of you were at Evans, he had a third visitor. Yeah, Edward Phelan came by uh, 9 p.m. that evening. Uh, did you also know Phelan from your time at Fort Snelling? I did. Can you recall what Phelan did that evening? I'll take this one if you don't mind, Foy. <laughs> it was my sense that Phelan's stop at Evans was unplanned. Seems that he uh, got bewildered that night and fell off a log while he was crossing the creek looking for his missing calf. On account of falling in the creek, he lost his hat. Showed up bareheaded that night. Do you remember anything else about that evening? Oh, yeah, he drank up all our whiskey. <laughs> anything that might pertain to Sergeant Hayes? Something that he might have said? Nope. I, I suppose it's too much to hope that you could say something on this matter. Ah, Foy, he don't pay nobody no mind. As I understand it, had a paddle. What did you say? A paddle. Oh. Thank you, Foy. Very helpful. <laughs> As I was saying, when Phelan left the next... No canoe. What's that? Had a paddle. No canoe. Oh, I forgot about that. That was rather strange. Phelan had walked all the way to Evans' place carrying nothing but a canoe paddle. Do you remember anything about the paddle? No, I didn't pay no mind. Do you, Foy? Can you describe it? Large. <laughs> what time did you leave the next morning? We left after breakfast, I'd say probably 8 p.m. Or excuse me, 8 a.m. Um, uh, and according to Evans, you were on your way to Phelan's place. Yeah, we were going there to see Hayes, but he weren't there. We got there and Phelan said he had just put him on the other side of the river. Uh, what time did Phelan leave? I don't know. He was there when we left Evans. He left after you? That's right. And he walked? Yeah, he figured it was faster to walk and he was still looking for that missing calf. How long did it take you to travel from Evans' house to Phelan's house? Well, let me see. We did make one stop. Uh, we met a canoe coming downriver, and we met them at the sandbar. That was Cluey and Menke and that Frenchman. We got some liquor from them. Uh, probably about a half an hour from Evans' place to the sandbar. Ain't that right, Foy? Yeah, and then we didn't stop anymore on our way up to Phelan's. Probably another half an hour from the sandbar to Phelan's. A total about an hour. Did you pass any other canoes before you arrived at Phelan's Landing? Nope. Uh, did you see any of Baker's men heading down river in a canoe? Ah, the only canoe that we passed was Mankey and Kluwitz, which we met at the sandbar. Oh, and of course, Phelan's. You saw Phelan in a canoe? Yeah, before we got there. He was coming downstream, and uh, he stopped at Phelan's land in maybe 40, 50 yards before we got there. Was anyone else in the canoe? No. Uh, when you saw Phelan's canoe in the river, did it come from the opposite shore? No, it was definitely coming downstream because uh, had it come from the opposite shore where we saw him, 
we would have had to go around the head of a large island, and that would have taken well over half an hour. But you best ask Foy here. He's got them eagle eyes. What about it, Foy? Please, this is important. Uh, a mile and a half before we got to Phelan's, saw a canoe ascending the Mississippi. Canoe came out from shore about halfway to the island, turned around, went back down, and um, landed where we went ashore when we were about 30 rods out. In positive, Phelan got out of the canoe. In positive, no canoe crossed the Mississippi from the time we left Evans Landing until we got to Phelan's. In positive, Phelan's canoe did not cross the Mississippi because it was in sight the whole time. Okay then. <laughs> Tell me what happened after you landed. Well, we got out of the canoe. Foy immediately went up the bluff towards Phelan's house. I took a different trail along the river bottom. I walked it maybe 10 rods. And then I saw this area where all the herbage was trampled down. There was a considerable body of blood in that spot, and there was blood splattered on the plants around there. Uh, blood, was it fresh? Yeah, I'd say it hadn't laid there a day at the furthest. I think that it looked like there was a heavy body that had been laying there, and I thought maybe the cattle had been wounded by the Indians, and that was the source of the blood. Were there any cattle thereabouts? I don't recollect any signs of that, and the river bottom was wet at that time. That's not a place a cattle would frequent. Did you see any signs of something being dragged along the trail? I don't recall any signs of that. I walked up the bluff to Phelan's house, where I saw him and inquired about Hayes. He told me he had just put Hayes across the river. I asked about the cattle, if he had any wounded, and told him what I had seen at the river bottom. But he told me something about it couldn't have been his because none were wounded. It must have been cattle from the Gervais. Were you aware of any dispute between Phelan and Hayes? No, not really. I guess Phelan said something about them building a root cellar and getting into an argument about what direction they're throwing the dirt out of that, but not really a dispute. Well, thank you. You've been very helpful. Let's go for it. Would you send in Dr. Emerson, please? Will do. Dr. Emerson. Thank you for coming in. Please sit down. <laughs> you were dispatched on Monday, September 30th, with a team of men to investigate a body at Carver's Cave. That is correct. Could you tell me your findings based upon your examination of the body? Of course. I discovered the body uh, perfectly naked, lying on its back, feet in the river, covered in grass and sand. We uncovered the body and washed it for the purpose of making the examination. The body had been mutilated in a most shocking manner, with the jawbone broken both upper and lower, the crushing of the temple, smashing of the cheek, and breaking of various other bones of the face. Could you determine what could have caused those injuries? Oh, it must have been some mighty weapon. Anything more specific? No. Could it, have, could it have been a canoe paddle? Yes. Do you think it was a canoe paddle? I have no reason to think one way or the other. Yeah. Why, George, this is important. I was asked to examine a body dead for at least a week, perhaps many weeks, most of that time in the river. And you want me to tell you what kind of weapon was used? I'm asking for your best professional judgment. My best professional judgment is that the wounds bear an appearance which would cause me to believe that such a weapon could have been used. Fine. 
would it be unreasonable for me to ask you to conclude that the injuries were the cause of death? No problem whatsoever. I have no hesitation in stating that the cause of the death of James Hayes was the blow to the side of the face causing some massive injuries, likely with a heavy object, possibly a canoe paddle, that resulted in the breaking of the bones of the side of the face into many pieces. John. Sir? His name was John Hayes. You called him James Hayes. <clears throat> John Hayes, yeah, quite right. Despite the extensive damage to the face, there was no question on his identity? Oh, none whatsoever. The identification having been made in the affirmative, principally upon his gray hair and a very unusual and long nose, which remained unadulterated in the affair, the identification having been made by Bartholomew Baldwin, Franklin Steele, Daniel McPhail, and um, oh, Edward Phelan, all strong acquaintances of the deceased. Phelan? Yes, sir? I wasn't aware that Phelan had been dispatched with you. Oh, he wasn't. By George, I must be hearing things. I must be working too hard. No, 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 no. We picked up Edward Phelan along the way. Uh, he was returning upriver from his own examination of the body when we encountered him. He examined the body before you did? Yes, uh, he was at that point returning to the garrison for making to make known the fact that he had discovered the body of James Hayes. John. Sir? Thank you, that's all. <clears throat> I have been taking the testimony of several other witnesses, and I have some questions for you. You testified that you spent the night of Thursday, September 5th at Evans' house and left the next morning. I've since learned that Scott and Foy were there as well, and they left by canoe before you. No, no, no. We left at the same time. How long did it take you to walk from Evans' house to your house? Uh, about a half an hour. I made that walk, uh, and that's very fast, especially if you're searching for a missing calf on your walk home. I'm a fast walker, and I don't figure I lost any time searching for that calf. Do you believe that Phelan... No, here's my other question. Did you tell Mrs. Gervais that one of Baker's men visited Hayes that morning and offered him a ride in the canoe? No, I never said that. There was no such visitor? No, we didn't have any visitors that morning. Well, Scott and Foy were visitors. Oh, yeah, but they arrived after, after I put Hayes across the river. Did Hayes take any weapons with him? No. And he wasn't afraid of the Indians either. Why not? Well, he wasn't planning on taking back any portion of that calf. He just wanted to satisfy himself as to whether those Indians took it or not. Did Scott tell you about the blood he found on the river bottom? Said something about that. And you didn't suspect that this was from your missing calf? No, and it wasn't. That calf returned on its lonesome the same day. If the Indians didn't take the calf, why would they kill Sergeant Evan, uh, Sergeant F Hayes? Well, I figure for his clothes. You know, when he went off that day, he was wearing his very best clothes. But when we found him in the river, he was buck naked. How did you come to examine the body before Dr. Emerson? Well, John Campbell advised me about the body on the night of the 29th. He told me that he and some Indians had found it near the river, near his property. So I went the next morning to determine whether it was Hayes, and it was. When I found the body, just the head and the shoulders were out of the water. So I dragged the corpse up onto the shore. 
I covered it over with some grass and some sand. And then I went back to the fort to report all this. On the way back, I ran into Dr. Emerson. I came back down the river in his, in his Mackinac boat, and I pointed out for him where the body was. You told Mrs. Gervais that that night, Phelan did something that was incredibly stupid. Do you remember that? You told her that Hayes had gone to Hayes and Moore's house. I never said that. You didn't? No. Hayes never intended to go anywhere other than the Little Crow's Village. Well, if that's true, why did you wait two days before reporting him being missing? I didn't. I went to the Gervais on Saturday, the very next day, and I told him all about it. Mrs. Gervais said you came on Sunday. No, that's wrong. There are many contradictions between your account and her account. I deny everything that lady has to say. She's a much more credible witness than you, and she has no reason to lie. That lady hates me. I believe that you told her that Hayes went to Hayes and Moore's for the purpose of preventing any early search for the deceased so that you would have enough time to properly dispose of the body. And apparently, it took you two days. You are brooding. I'm brooding now? Yes. Before I was fretting. I'm not fretting anymore? No. There's a difference? <laughs> yes. This, now, this is brooding. Didn't get what you hoped for from your new witnesses? I did. They were very helpful. Phelan's story is that he took Hayes across the river to search for a calf because he thought the Indians had stolen him. But Phelan didn't have enough time to go from Evans to his house to get Hayes to cross and recross the river before Scott and Boyd visited him. So that was a lie. And when he was questioned about the blood on the river bottom, he said that it couldn't have been any of their cattle. If he had a missing calf, he would not have reacted that way. I believe that the whole affair of the missing calf is also a fabrication. And why are you brooding? Phelan is refuting the accounts of all of my witnesses, date, time, and what they said. And I can't find any proof either one way or the other. So go get proof. I can't. There is no proof. You know, I think that you were right. Sibley transferred this case to me because he knew it couldn't be won. <laughs> that is not what I said. Of course it is. No, it is not. Your life will become so much better when you start listening to my words. <laughs> what did you say then? I said that the case against Phelan must not be very strong. It's the same thing. No, it is not. You said that the case cannot be won. I said that the case against Phelan must not be very strong. It's as different as fretting is from brooding. <laughs> you know, Sibley, he knows that you are a much better justice of the peace. He knows that you will work harder than anyone. He transferred this case to you because it is important and it deserves your talents. He respects you. As well he should. Mm. <laughs> so, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to work harder. <laughs> what does work harder mean if there is no proof? More witnesses. So go get more witnesses. Mr. Baldwin, thank you for coming in. Please sit down. I understand that Sergeant Hayes was a close friend of yours. Yes. I'm sorry for your loss. Everything that I've heard about him was that he was a good man. He was. Thank you. 
because you could identify him, you were dispatched with McPhail and Emerson and Wachita, uh, the Indian whose son found the body. Uh, to, and, and then along the way, you uh, ran into Edward Phelan, and he accompanied you uh, to the Carver Cave. Tell me what happened when you arrived. Phelan directed us to the location of the body, and he had covered him with grass and sand. We cleared that off, and Hayes was naked. His face was badly beaten, but we knew it was Hayes. Uh, Dr. Emerson uh, completed his examination, and uh, we buried him. But what she had told me that that's not where his son had found the, the corpse. The body had been moved? Well, he, he said his son found it some distance upriver from there. Uh, so we returned to that location, and I, I looked around and found a trail. The bushes were beaten down, and there were gray hairs sticking to the herbage, which I took to be wolf hairs. Didn't Sergeant Hayes have gray hair? Well, yes, he wore very gray hair, similar to that of a wolf, but, but his hair had been cut short just before he disappeared. So these hairs were long that I saw. And there were many wolf tracks around the trail, so I saw no long, any reason to investigate any further. Because you're so, so well acquainted with, with Sergeant Hayes, I hope that you'll be able to provide me with some information to help me understand his, his mind and his character. The story that I've been told is that Sergeant Hayes, who spoke only a few words of Dakota, went alone and unarmed and in his best clothes for a five mile trek to the Dakota village to determine if the Indians had the calf and without any intention of reclaiming the calf if they did. Does that sound like something Sergeant Hayes would do? No, I, I don't see what he had to gain by making that trip. It's also been suggested to me that he went to obtain proof of the theft to take to the Indian agent, Major Tolliver, uh, because he had the authority to compensate settlers in that matter. Uh, Hayes was a sergeant. Uh, I believe he would have reported the crime to Major Tolliver, who had the responsibility to conduct investigations of Indian crimes. Can you think of any other motive Hayes would have for taking a trip down to Little Crow's village? No. How about to seek a wife? Maybe. Uh, Balin did say something about that. Besides him saying that, would you have any other reason to believe that? Well, Hayes did tell me once he had a mind to buy an Indian girl. Oh. I'm going to be very blunt with my next question. You have spoken to Phelan. Would you have any reason to believe that he killed Sergeant Hayes? None. I've been to Phelan's house several times, and I've never seen anything that would lead me to suppose that he had killed him, nor have I ever heard anything that would lead me to suppose so. Do you know of anyone else who might have done it? I have no reasonable cause to suspect any particular person of having murdered him. I have never heard a threat made against him by either white men or Indian. Thank you. I appreciate it. Although it will be very painful for me, could you please ask Mr. and Mrs. Gervais to come in? <laughs> brought us back again. Do you know how hard it is for us to make this trip with, what, how many boys we got now? Six, I think. Seven! How can you forget the baby? You hear that, Brown? We got a two-month-old baby needs tending to. Our baby. He's the first white, white chi child born here. Yes, I've heard about it. Uh, you should be very proud. That's all anybody talks about. Well, OK, then. Mr. Gervais, do any of your cattle ever wander down to the river bottom below Phelan's house? Yes, 
They're in the habit of going down there before the frost strikes the grass in the prairie. Our son Alphonse is forever herding them back. Were any of your cattle wounded last month? No. What do you mean, wounded? Cut somehow that caused them to bleed out. No. There are always some cattle that are diseased in the feet, but they wouldn't bleed much from a sore. How much blood are you talking about? Oh, a lot. Uh, did your son, when he brought the cattle back, ever mention seeing blood in the river bottom? No, I never heard of any blood in the river bottom. I, I cannot imagine how it could get there. Have you heard of anyone else's cattle being injured? I know of no cattle being wounded last summer or fall, and I think if any of our neighbor's cattle had been wounded, I would have heard of it. How about any cattle killed or wounded by the Indians? There was that band of Dakota that done shot and killed four of the Perry's cattle. Three. They shot four. But one lived. When was this? About a year ago. Uh, and um, did, did any uh, of the uh, Indians, either one way or the other, uh, cause any problems? Was there any problems after that? Not that I can think of. I have one last question for you. Are you aware of any quarrel between Phelan and Hayes? I never heard of any misunderstanding between Phelan and his partner. And I think I would have perceived it if such had been the case. They always appeared to get along well with each other. Phelan is a rogue! Thank you for your time. <laughs> would you please ask James Hewitt to come in? You brought us back all this way for this. Joseph, James, I'm so sorry to bring you into this formal proceeding, but it's good indeed to see my good friend and partner. Well, that's all right. I want to be whatever help I can. I've been trying to establish the time for certain events on the morning of September 6th. It's my understanding that you met Scott and Foy on a sandbar that morning and sold them some whiskey. That's right. Uh, I was going up the river with Menke and Pierre Gervais, and we started, the two of them, oh, maybe about uh, 10, 15 minutes south of Evans Sandbar. Uh, and what time was that? Oh, it must have been approximately 8 o'clock. See, we sold them some whiskey, and then we talked to them for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Well, we talked with Scott, that is. The other guy didn't say anything, and I mean nothing. I doubt if a single word passed his mouth. So they would have left the sandbar about 8.30? Well, we both did at the same time. Now, they had a bark canoe. It was empty, and so they made good time. Our canoe was loaded, so they gained about a third of the distance on us uh, between the sandbar and uh, <coughs> Phelan's place. It took us about three-quarters of an hour. So they would have gotten there about 9 o'clock. Did you see any canoes crossed the river at Phelan's Landing as you were paddling up river? No, no, no. See, about half a mile north of the sandbar, we had a clear view of the river. We would have seen any canoe going across. It would have been impossible for any canoe to cross uh, when we were out there. Um, <coughs> how long would you estimate it would take to cross the Mississippi at Phelan's Landing? Well, depending on the man in the canoe, I'd say about 10 minutes. Did you see any other canoes on your way to Phelan's? No, no, no. Uh, specifically, I'm interested in if you encountered any of Baker's men. No, no, not at all. Thank you very much. You've corroborated a number of important facts. Now, you don't think Phelan killed Hayes, did you? I do. I believe that the night that he went to Evans was the night he committed the murder. And in all probability, he was fresh from the deed when he got there. He showed up with a, with a canoe paddle. What would you be doing with a canoe paddle searching for a calf on land? So you don't put much stock in that idea that an Indian killed him. 
No, no, I don't at all. I've heard Phelan's story about him having trouble with the Dakota, but I don't put any stock in that at all. Well, that surprises me, Jane, because you know you got shot in your shoulder by a Dakota Indian, and of course, you know, one of our employees was uh, uh, killed by a Dakota horse thief, and of course, that marauding group of uh, Indians, they ransacked our whiskey shop. I doubt that Little Crow's band would have killed any white man that close to the fort. And they certainly would have not brought news of the body to Fort Snelling if they had done so. Phelan has told so many lies that you can't possibly do anything but suspect him. But, but why would Phelan kill Hayes? I don't know. I can't figure it out. Everybody I talk to says that they were friendly together. I can't think of one credible reason why Phelan would kill Hayes. You are upset. <laughs> this is far beyond brooding and fretting. I know that Phelan murdered Hayes. I have multiple corroborating witnesses that he lied. But after all this time, I can't figure out why he did it. How was Sergeant Hayes killed? Oh, you don't want to know. It's gruesome. Phelan blames the Dakota. Who better to help? He was found in the river with his face crushed in multiple places and his clothes missing. Mm, a battered face. Not the Dakota. Why not the Dakota? You sell us guns and knives. We use guns and knives. Well, you have clubs and tomahawks and canoe paddles. When you kill a man with a knife, that is bravery. But when you batter his face, that is passion. That is anger. Ask yourself, did Phelan have a reason to be angry with Hayes? I don't know. Tell me about this Phelan... Well, he was a retired army private who shared a house with Sergeant Hayes. Oh, well, maybe it was jealousy. Jealousy? Mm -hmm. <coughs> jealousy is passion. I don't know what Phelan would be jealous about. Money? Uh, he was a private, and Hayes is a Fort Snelling sergeant. No, I thought of that. Hayes had money, $200, but he left it with Lieutenant McPhail at the fort for safekeeping. There's no way that Phelan could get that money by killing Hayes. Not to get, to want. We are talking about jealousy, not theft. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. That's a white man's sin. Oh, it's interesting. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. This started out with a missing calf. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. By George. If Hayes was planning to get a wife, he would have moved out and, and sold his, his tools, his equipment, his, his, all of his cattle. But no, he, he wouldn't have done that. Uh, he wouldn't have done that uh, to his partner and have him starve. No, but, but, but maybe Phelan didn't think it was enough. I did all the work, but you sat at Fort Snelling and collected your sergeant's pay. I made the claim on the house. I, I made the claim on the land. I built the house. I tended our animals, and now you're abandoning me. Maybe, maybe Phelan felt betrayed. Oh, he was, he was probably drunk. He was drunk all the time. <coughs> and, and, and they had an argument, and, and, and the argument turned into a fight. But would that have been enough for Phelan to be so angry to kill him? No. No, that wouldn't have been enough. Maybe it was an accident. <laughs> That's it. He didn't intend to kill him. <laughs> Face crushed in multiple places? <laughs> that is not an accident. Oh, right. I'm missing something. What could make Phelan so angry to kill 
haze so violently. Always a woman to make the white man go crazy. <coughs> By George, the wife. Hayes could afford to buy one, and Phelan could not. <laughs> and he wasn't having any success betting Sophia Perry. So, so here was Phelan losing out to an older, unattractive, big-nosed, gray-haired army sergeant. That's what Phelan was so upset about, and that's why he crushed his entire face, except for that big, ugly nose. <laughs> Phelan, that could be his motive. It was probably jealousy. <laughs> Aren't you impressed that I, that I figured it out? <laughs> You are a brilliant man, Joseph Brown, <laughs> who still does not listen to my words. <laughs> Joseph, congratulations. August 26th, 1848. That's going to be a historic year for all of us. The Stillwater Convention. That's right. Yes, but that's only the first step in a long process of forming the territory of Minnesota. We need your help in Washington to persuade Congress to pass this legislation. I'll do it. Well, for my part, I am honored to be representing the village of St. Paul. <laughs> You're only here to ensure that we put the capital there. Can you think of any better place? Is that Edward Phelan? Now, Joseph, just just take it easy. Just just relax. Don't. I, I can't I, believe that the jury acquitted him. Yeah, but Joseph, just don't. Everything's going so well. Don't let Phelan spoil the convention no, for no, you. It's a good thing they did acquit him because, you know, the Indian uh, confessed to the murder. That alleged deathbed confession? That's bunk. You put too much stock in that local lore. No one can tell me who the Indian was, who he confessed to, what he confessed to, whether he confessed to Hayes or some other white man. Maybe there was no confession at all. No, no, settle down. Settle down, Joseph. I know you worked hard on this case. You got a lot invested in it, and you think that Phelan killed him. But I've gotten to know him the past few years. There's nothing I can see about him that would indicate he was capable of killing Hayes. I'm oh, going to say something. Oh, Joseph, don't, no, please, don't, don't. What are you doing here, Phelan? Oh, oh your honor. I was duly selected by the settlers on the Prospect Hill area to represent them at this here territorial convention. And what are you doing here? You have no place among civic and well-disposed people. These people? Yes. Oh, Your Honor, as I'm looking around here, I rightly don't see anybody here any better than me. You're a murderer and a compulsive liar. Oh, Your Honor, that's a terribly hurtful thing to say, especially in light of the fact that that good and able jury found me innocent of any crime. They declared you not guilty. It's not the same thing. All the same, here I stand, a free man. You murdered Hayes, and there's no citizen in the vicinity that has any doubt about that. Your Honor, I assume that you had heard that one of the Indians from Little Crow's village confessed to that crime right about the time that he died. I put no stock in that. Oh, you should. I, I feared that right from the very beginning, and I told everybody who would listen. In fact, I went out with a couple of my friends that I rounded up and searched for my good friend, twice. Don't slander his name by calling him your good friend. You murdered Hayes, and you acquired his cattle, and you tried to get his land. Your Honor, we were partners. I deserve that land for all the hard work that I did. You know that. Oh, really? What did you do? 
Well, I worked hard and I went on to do others a lot of good things because of the help that I provided for, for, for Mr. Hayes. Well, yeah, yes, but your reputation? Yeah. Oh, your reputation? What you, I have read your military record. What you, and, you, and you're a transplant from the Sixth Ward of Manhattan. Lawless criminals, the whole lot of them. And they didn't know what to do with you, so they sent you to Fort Snelling. But you could not shed the stink of the Sixth Ward. And you are permeated everything that you've ever done. Your Honor. Everybody respected me, and from the beginning, once that jury found me not guilty, once that Indian confessed, my reputation was restored. And there's one thing you have to understand about us Irish from the, from the Sixth Ward of New York. What's that? We are survivors. You were sloppy and, and got away with it. You're smug. But I promise you that the next time you come around, you'll end up on the other side, and you'll get your comeuppance, and I hope that I'm there to see it. Well, until that day, Your Honor. Until that day. present day Dayton's Bluff Mound Park area. My marriage to Rose Perry was the first Christian marriage here in St. Paul. We set up house game here at Fourth and Lafayette. Then we moved out to White Bear Lake where we had 12 children together. In perhaps the bargain of the century, for a mere $10, I purchased the land bounded by present day Robert Street, Jackson Street, Shepherd Road, and Fourth Street from Pig's Eye Perron, the whiskey trader. I donated part of my land for our first church, the historic chapel of St. Paul, which was consecrated in 1841 on the same day that the congregation voted to change the village's name from Pig's Eye to St. Paul. That vote was unanimous. <laughs> I left St. Paul in 1844 to found a new settlement which I called Little Canada. Jarvis Lake bears my name and my headstone in St. John's Cemetery in Little Canada proudly declares Ben Gervais, the first settler of St. Paul. First settler of St. Paul. Ha! In contrast, I died almost forgotten, like so many pioneer women. I'm buried next to him in an unmarked grave, and the newspaper couldn't even see fit to print a death notice. In 1836, I vaccinated over 300 Indians to protect them against smallpox. But I am most famous for a slave that I owned, Dred Scott, who sued for his freedom on the argument that, having been brought to Fort Snelling, he was in free territory and therefore entitled to his freedom. The infamous Dred Scott case reached the United States Supreme Court in 1857, and the court ruled against Scott seven to two on the grounds that anybody of African ancestry could not claim citizenship in the United States. I was the first representative of Minnesota to Congress, to the United States Congress. I was the first uh, governor of the state of Minnesota. I was the uh, president of the Minnesota Historical Society. I uh, was a longtime member of the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota. Um, Sibley County is named for me, as are the cities of Sibley, North Dakota, and Sibley, Iowa. Uh, oh, and uh, Hastings, Minnesota. Hastings is my middle name. So. <laughs> I also commanded the Minnesota Militia in the 1862 U.S.-Dakota War. But, but that was a terrible, terrible conflict. It was a terrible thing for everybody concerned. Hundreds and hundreds of settlers and soldiers in Dakota lost their lives in that war. I, uh, after the war, a 
about 1,600 non-combatants, men, women, and children, all Dakota, were rounded up and herded into a, a camp at Fort Snelling where they were interned along with about 2,000 Ho-Chunk who had played no part whatsoever in that conflict. They uh, were waiting for exile from the state of Minnesota. And they were exiled. The Dakota reservations were abolished. Trials were held, trials before a military tribunal in which no defendant was afforded uh, the opportunity to have a lawyer. As a result, 38 Dakota men were hanged all together, all at once, down in Mankato in the largest one-day mass execution in U.S. history. I was part French, but I was also a member of the Sisseton tribe of Dakota. I was Mr. Brown's third wife. He divorced his second wife for me. <laughs> we also had 12 children together. During the Dakota War, I was spurred on, I must say, by treaty violations by the United States government, which caused continuing hardship and hunger amongst the Dakota. I saved the lives of my family and several white men who were captured with us through sheer force of my character. When I confronted our captors, and declared my ties to the Sisseton tribe. I am buried in St. Mary's Episcopal Cemetery on the Sisseton Wapaton Reservation in South Dakota. I was a musician, a soldier, a trapper. I uh, was an agriculturalist, a journalist, a judge, a road builder, a town founder, a county creator, I was the framer of the state constitution. I was a newspaper editor, and I proposed the name Minnesota for the territory, based on the Dakota word, which means water tinted like the sky. But after all my accomplishments, my first criminal case still remains unsolved. After my trial, I was not well liked by the locals. <laughs> so I sold my land along the river, along with the cabin and the root house, for $200. Now that same land today is home to some of the finest buildings in the city of St. Paul. River Center, the Science Museum, XL Energy Center, Ordway Theater, the St. Paul Public Library, even this magnificent, magnificent center that you're in tonight, the Landmark Center. After I left my home in, in, uh, along the river, I moved just a little further north and made a claim along a certain creek. And that land then became home to the city's first lumber mill, the first saw, uh, sawmill, and even the historic Pam's Brewery. I became one of the largest cattle owners in town as well. But in 1850, a year after Minnesota became a territory, I was indicted for perjury, lying under oath. Me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I took my leave from Minnesota as quickly as I could. I hopped on a wagon train heading out west. You know, there was a gold rush going on about that time. But along the way, I evidently offended the men on the wagon train, and they murdered me. <laughs> <laughs> claiming self-defense. <laughs> well, I guess I did receive the uh, comeuppance that Joseph Brown predicted for me. But I was, and I am, a survivor. My name lives on in many locations, especially on the east side of the city of St. Paul. Phelan Creek, Phelan Lake, Phelan Park, Phelan Golf Course, Phelan Ice Arena, Phelan Elementary School, Phelan Boulevard, the list goes on and on. <laughs> but John Hayes, you won't find his name anywhere in St. Paul. And his bones still lie along the base of the river, down the hill from Dayton's Bluff.
clapping applause. It is never gonna happen again in the planet Earth. Quick few announcements. One, um, the story was the result of uh, research done in the journal of Joseph Brown, discovered by a historian who developed it into a book, didn't end the play. Gary, Gary Brueggemann is the historian author. We had him in the cast tonight. <laughs> He started the research early, obviously. With that, his book will be available for sale. He will autograph it out there. If you haven't finished all of your holiday shopping yet, and you have anybody in your family who likes history or murder, you might want to get a personally autographed copy of Gary's book. I want to do that. I want to also thank somewhere out here is our director, Joe. Joe Hendren. He might be back. OK, Joe, come on up. He tried to direct a cast that was mostly lawyers and judges. <laughs> tried to, and um, he must have a background in children's theater. Number two, uh, and finally, William Sikorsky is out here. William, stand up, wave, maybe he left. There's Bill, okay, Bill. The playwright who developed this into a script for us, and he had to watch us today do some of his words in the order he wrote them. Thank you for your patience, William. Friends, we got one more night. If you didn't like it, discretion is a better part of valor. We're done. So most of you are around to chat with you about questions we probably can't answer. Have a good evening. Yeah.